Hi everyone, it's time for the Magician's Elephant Chapter 6. Now today we're going to meet another new character in the book. And one of the things I really like about the way Kate DiCamalo works, her writings, is she does bring all of these wonderful dynamic characters. And I know as a class we've worked on how characters relate to each other in her stories. So think about the um, miraculous journey of Edward Tulane and also think about um, because of when Dixie, she brings so many beautiful, vibrant characters together in these stories. Each of them have their own story to tell, but at the same time, they're all being pulled to that central theme, that central theme and message in her books. Okay, for example, in Because of When Dixie, all of those characters experienced their own version of the word sorrow. And in The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, each of those characters were all learning to discover the true value of love. So as we're meeting all of these characters in The Magician's Elephant, think about what is that central theme? What is it that connects all of them together? What is it that's bringing them to each other? All right, so chapter six, Peter dreamed Vilna Lutz. Vilna Lutz was ahead of him in a field and he, Peter, was running to catch up. Hurry, shouted Vilna Lutz. You must run like a soldier. The field was a field of wheat, and as Peter ran, the wheat grew taller and taller, and soon it was so tall that Vilna Lutz disappeared entirely from view, and Peter could only hear his voice shouting, Hurry, hurry, run like a man, run like a soldier. It is no good, said Peter. No good at all. I've lost him. I will never catch him, and it is pointless to run. He sat down and looked up at the blue sky. Around him, the wheat continued to grow, forming a golden wall, sealing him in, protecting him. It is almost like being buried, he thought. I will stay here forever, for all time. No one will ever find me. Yes, he said, I will stay here. And it was then that he noticed that there was a door in the wall of wheat. Peter stood and went to the wooden door and knocked on it, and the door swung open. Hello, called Peter. No one answered him. Hello, he called again. And when there was still no answer, he pushed the door open further and stepped over the threshold and entered the apartment he had once shared with his mother and father. Someone was crying. He went into the bedroom, and there on the bed, wrapped in a blanket, alone and wailing, was the baby. Whose baby is this, Peter said. Please, whose baby is this? The baby continued to cry, and the sound of it was heartbreaking to him. So he bent and picked her up. Oh, he said, shh, there, there. He held the baby and rocked her back and forth. After a time, she stopped crying and fell asleep. Peter could not get over how small she was, how easy it was to hold her, how comfortably she fit in his arms. The door to the apartment stood open, and he could hear the music of the wind moving through the grain. He looked out the window and saw the evening sun hanging golden over the field. For as far as his eye could see, there was nothing but light. And he knew suddenly and absolutely that the baby he held in his arms was his sister Adele. When he woke from the stream, Peter sat up straight and looked around the dark room and said, but that is how it was. She did cry. I remember I held her and she cried. So she could not after all have been born dead. And without ever drawing a breath, as Vilna Lutz had said time and time again, she cried. You must live to cry. He lay back down and imagined the weight of his sister in his arms. Yes, he thought, she cried, and I held her. I told my mother that I would watch out for her always. That is how it happened. I know it to be true. He closed his eyes, and again he saw the door from his dreams and felt what it was like to be inside that apartment and to hold his sister and look out at the field of light. 
The dream was too beautiful to doubt. The fortune teller had not lied. And if she had not lied about his sister, then perhaps she told the truth about the elephant, too. The elephant, said Peter. He spoke the word aloud to the ever-present dark, to the snoring Vilna Lutz, to the whole of the sleeping and indifferent city of Baltice. The elephant is what matters. She is with the countess. I must find some way to see her. I will ask Leo Matinee. He is an officer of the law, and he will know what to do. Surely there is some way to get inside, to get to the countess and then to the elephant, so that it can all be undone, so that it can at last be put right, because Adele does live. She lives. Less than five blocks from the apartment Polonaise stood a grim, dark building that bore the somewhat improbable name of the Orphanage of the Sisters of Perpetual Light. And on the top floor of that building was an austere dormitory outfitted with a series of small wrought iron beds lined up side by side one right after the other like metal soldiers. In each of those these beds slept an orphan, and the last of the beds in the drafty over-large dormitory, dormitory was occupied by a small girl named Adele, who soon after the incident at the opera house began to dream of the magician's elephant. In Adele's dreams, the elephant came and knocked at the door of the orphanage. Sister Marie, the sister of the door, the nun who admitted unwanted children to the orphanage, and the only person ever allowed to open and close the front door of the orphanage of the Sisters of Perpetual Light, was, of course, the one who answered the elephant's knock. Good of the evening to you, said the elephant, inclining her head toward Sister Marie. I have come for the collection of the little person that you are calling by the name Adele. Pardon, said Sister Marie. Adele, said the elephant. I have come for the collection of her. She is belonging elsewhere besides. You must speak up, said Sister Marie. I am old and I do not hear well. It is the one you are calling Adele, said the elephant in a slightly louder voice. I am coming for her to keep her and for taking her to where she is, after all, belonged. I am truly sorry, said Sister Marie, and her face did look sad. I cannot understand a word you are saying. Perhaps it is because you are an elephant. Could that be it? Could that be the cause of this hindrance in our communications? Understand, I have nothing against elephants. You yourself are an exceptionally elegant elephant and obviously well-mannered. There is no doubt, but the fact remains that I can make no sense of your words, and so I must bid you good night. And with this, Sister Marie closed the door. From a window in the dorm room, Adele watched the elephant walk away. Madam Elephant, she shouted, banging on the window. Here I am. Here. I am Adele. I am the one you are looking for. But the elephant continued to walk away from her. She went down the street and became smaller and then smaller still, until in the peculiar and frustrating sleight of hand that often occurs in dreams, the elephant was transformed into a mouse that then scurried into the gutter and disappeared entirely from Adele's view. And then it began to snow. The cobblestones of the street and the tiles of the roofs became coated in white. It snowed and snowed until everything disappeared. The world itself soon seemed to cease to exist, erased bit by bit by the white of the falling snow. In the end, there was nothing and no one in the world except for Adele who stood alone at the window of her dream, waiting. Well, I guess we were right. 
And I guess the fortune teller was right. Adele does live. And she knows that there is someone, or obviously she feels the elephant's connection. So think about this. The other thing I thought that was truly remarkable is listening to this chapter. Adele lived in the orphanage that was very close to where Peter lived. They were not that far apart, but yet they did not know where they were. Hmm. I can't wait to see if they will ever find each other. I will see you tomorrow.